fortification at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, GAIN. It's a Swiss foundation based here in Geneva. We're a very informal, small group tonight, so I think we're going to have a very interesting dialogue on iodine deficiency disorders and actual uh, eradication and control of iodine deficiency disorders. So tonight's meeting, we really wanted to do two things. Uh, one is we wanted to celebrate the great work that has been done over the last uh, 100 years, starting in Switzerland, but also over the last three decades primarily in the developing world that has led to us being very close to being able to say we're going to be able to control iodine deficiency disorders at a global level. That's the first part. The second part is a call to action. And we're hoping that you all go away today with actionable data, compelling ideas, a few stories that we're going to share with you that will paint a picture on how close we truly are to being able to eliminate iodine deficiency disorders. So GAIN is co-hosting this event along with the World Health Organization, with the Iodine Global Network, it's a Canadian foundation, a network of partners working in iodine, the Effective Altruism Foundation uh, here in Switzerland, and also ETH Zurich. So we have a lineup of uh, compelling speakers, and I've seen the presentations. I think they're going to be very good. Um, and we'll introduce each of the speakers. You have their bios in your handouts, so we won't go into a lot of detail on that. Um, to say, if you will please stay until the very end, we have some drinks available. Uh, I've been told two drinks only per person. Um, and then incidentally, if any of you want to Google, I wouldn't Google too much while you're here, but if you look up iodized vodka or iodine in whiskey, you will learn that those beverages do exist. We are not serving them tonight, though. And also, if you, you cannot get your iodine nutrition through those two uh, beverages, so let you know. So without further ado, uh, what I would like to do is call up our first speaker, which is uh, Professor Michael Zimmerman. He is the chair of the board of the Iodine Global Network. He's also the editor for the quarterly newsletter on iodine deficiency disorders, which is a quarterly update on the latest related to iodine nutrition globally. He's also the head of the human laboratory on, hum uh, sorry, the laboratory on human nutrition at ETH Zurich. So Michael. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight to talk about iodine deficiency disorders. Um, uh, iodine deficiency and its control worldwide has been uh, termed a public health triumph, and I'd like to try to convince you of that. Right, so, um, as you all know, of course, goiter is the most visible sign of iodine deficiency. And here we see a, a beautiful young woman from the Congo with a goiter in her neck. But the most important effect by far is not goiter, it's actually the mental impairment or the cognitive impairment that occurs when people are iodine deficient. So a, a woman like this with a goiter in her neck, when she becomes pregnant, her fetus uh, will not receive adequate thyroid hormone and the brain won't develop in that fetus. So this fetus brain, you can see here is a kind of a classic picture comparing the nerve density in two slices from an iodine deficient brain and an iodine sufficient brain. And you can see the architecture is completely modified by um, iodine deficiency. So iodine deficiency damages the developing brain and this is the main reason that we're fighting so hard to control iodine deficiency around the world. Now, we, you're going to hear more about this, but maternal iodine deficiency then, so iodine deficiency during pregnancy, um, sharply lowers IQ in children. These are two studies from Zaire in China showing you that the IQ, or the developmental quotient, in children born to deficient mothers versus those who receive supplemental iodine during pregnancy is about 10 to 15 points lower. Now, the, the cretinism, you've probably heard about cretinism, um, in most countries, cretinism is a historical condition, but I saw these two cretins, for example, recently in China. Neurologic cretinism on the, on the left and myxedematous cretinus on the right. This is the tip of the iceberg. This is severe mental and growth retardation from iodine deficiency. In this condition, cretinism used to be very common in many countries before we began iodine prophylaxis, including Switzerland. Now, um, the World Health Organization did a nice uh, meta-analysis with, with a systematic review looking at 89 studies worldwide from many different countries and concluded that when you introduce iodized salt into populations, 
that are severely iodine deficient, you get an 82% decrease in goiter, an 87% decrease in cretinism, and a 73% decrease in the number of people in the population with a low IQ. So really dramatic of impacts on health and development from uh, the introduction of iodized salt. So I'd like to show a short video now. It's just two minutes long, but it's a very nice piece from Nicholas Kristof, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist at the New York Times about IDD. Look, I'm kind of nervous about doing this video. The truth is, I don't want to bore you. When I come back from poor countries, normally I have video of starving kids or burned out villages. And this time, I come back with images of rocks? Well, here's why. One of the most desperate needs in poor countries, but one that never gets adequate attention because it's not visual, is iodine. Studies have shown that when a pregnant woman doesn't have enough iodine in her body, her child suffers irreversible brain damage. That child will often have an IQ that is 10 to 15 points lower than it would otherwise be. Worldwide, more than a billion IQ points are lost due to iodine deficiency. What's more, iodine deficiency can lead to dwarfism and large goiters that swell the neck. But the biggest problem is mental retardation either the more extreme form known as cretinism or, more commonly, a milder loss of intelligence. The darkness of the color tells us the content of the iodine in the salt. I and mean, if there is no iodine, then there will, no, there will be no change in the color. One of the impediments has been the groundless rumor that iodized salt is a contraceptive, part of a Western conspiracy to keep Muslims from having babies. That's absurd, and it finally seems to be fading. Now, we don't think of iodized salt as a form of foreign aid. But in fact, it's hard to imagine any other kind of foreign assistance that can help more people with less money than taking salt like this and dripping iodine into it. There will be tens of thousands of people who will be saved from uh, being mentally retarded or suffering from garter. The amount that we are spending is very little. But the benefit that we get from this very little amount is enormous. We have here an extraordinary opportunity to make a difference in lives all over the world. In Pakistan, for the New York Times, I'm Nicholas Kristof. Okay, I really like that piece because it, of course, shows you a little bit about the, the process of iodization of salt and testing iodized salt for iodine in it. Um, Nicholas Kristof has been a champion of the iodine deficiency disorders, has written several very compelling pieces on, um, on this topic. Okay, so I mentioned at the, do you want to go, yeah. I mentioned at the beginning that, that some, the, the global progress against iodine deficiency around the world has been considered a public health triumph, maybe even on the scale of the elimination of smallpox. And I'd like to show you what's happened over the last two decades in terms of global control of iodine deficiency. And as Greg touched on in his introduction, this has been a, a global effort by many different players, national governments, um, WHO, UNICEF, the Micronutrient Initiative, GAIN. A lot of um, agencies have worked hard on this, and I'd like to show you the results. So this is the world in 1993, and all the countries that are in purple color had iodine deficiency at the national level based on goiter rates in school children. That was, our, that was the way we measured um, iodine deficiency back in the old days. By 2003, look over a decade, the enormous progress. So the countries that now have gray color are the ones that now have adequate iodine intakes because they've introduced iodized salt programs. And this includes most of Latin America and very large Asian countries like India and China. <clears throat> By 2007, you can see further progress, particularly in uh, Southeast Asia and in Africa. 2012, further progress, but then we have popping up a few countries which have high iodine intakes from either over iodized salt or other natural sources of iodine in the environment. And here's the picture in 2017. So we have now only 19 countries 
with national or subnational data that remain iodine deficient around the world. So we actually see the light at the end of the tunnel. And what we need now is to push hard and see if we can reach the remaining countries and see if we can eliminate the uh, iodine deficiency on the global level, like the title of this symposium. So you can see this is uh, another way of looking at it. You can see the number of iodine deficient countries has fallen from 113 around 1990 to only 19 in 2017. This is really a remarkable uh, progress. And it turns out it all started here in Switzerland. The Swiss iodized salt program was the first national iodized salt program. It was founded in 1922 in Appenzell and gradually spread into all the cantons of Switzerland. And um, this is the oldest program and one of the best programs. Part of the um, reason it's been so successful is because, as you may know, there's a salt monopoly in Switzerland. And all of our salt comes from two places, from the Swiss uh, salt works in, near Basel and from the small Bex uh, salt works here in the Valais. But anyway, a very successful program. Um, you may not know it, but in the Valais, back in the 1800s, going up into the mountain valleys to see the cretins was a tourist attraction. I mean, there were so many cretins up there. It was estimated there were 3,000 cretins in the canton of Valais, and probably about 5% of newborns were affected by cretinism because iodine deficiency was so severe. Another good example of this, historical example, is Napoleon sent his, um, his uh, people up into the Valais to recruit soldiers for his grand army back in the early 1800s, and they came back down with no men. Because he said, either they all have goiters too big to wear the uniform, or the cretins. So he was furious. Um. Um, yeah, so I mean, iodine deficiency was so bad in Switzerland. Look at this. This is a beautiful uh, Baroque house in northern Switzerland. And look at the, um, look at the, look at the large multi-nodular goiter that was actually modeled onto that cherub on the side of the house. It just shows you how, how normal and how extensive iodine deficiency was in Switzerland in the old days. This actually was just, just came out this week. This was an article in Watson, which is a nice online portal. And um, there's been some discussion lately about increasing the iodine content in Swiss salt again. And you can see here, um, yeah, worsening iodine deficiency in, the, in Switzerland. Will we turn into the idiots of the Alps? So, you can read that on Watson if you'd like. It's a nice story with some nice video. Now, to finish up, um, there's been several meetings of what's called the Copenhagen Consensus. Uh, the, the one in 2012 involved four Nobel laureates and dozens of other eminent economists. And they basically looked at how spending can most effectively improve the lives of the world's poorest and most afflicted people. And as probably many of you know, um, in 2012, the highest ranked solution yielding the most benefit for the least cost was providing micronutrients, including iodized salt, to children. I think we're going to hear more about the cost effectiveness of iodine. So just to finish up, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, thank you, of course, for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions in the, in the panel discussion. These are some of the major supporters of the Iodine Global Network, including, including GAIN. Um, I'd like to say that Larry Grummer-Strawn, who's in the audience, and I kind of set up the structure of the Iodine Global Network about four or five years ago. So Larry was really the founding father of the organization. Um, and you can see our, our contacts here. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. We are going to have a question and answers, I think, at the very end of all the presenters. Since we're a small group today, I think it might work best that way. I did some dangerous math. I want to run by you, though, uh, while you were talking. So 1993, we, we, we looked at 113 countries iodine deficient. Today, 24 years later, we're looking at uh, 19, right? So that's 24 years. That's 94 countries. Divide 94 by 23. That's 3.75 is what my calculator showed. <laughs> so does that, that would mean five more years, five times 3.75, would get the rest of the 19 countries. What do you think of that? <laughs> well, you, you, saw the, you saw in that figure, the graph figure, how you know, there was real rapid progress at the beginning, and all, you know, all the low-hanging fruit fell. And what's really difficult now is the remaining countries, not only the 19 who are deficient, but also some countries that we don't really have good data on. Those are, of course, 
you know, much harder nuts to crack. So I think, I don't think you can base future trends on past trends when it comes to side efficiency. It may be more difficult. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I, I, I hope that um, one of our presenters, uh, Dr. Francesco Branca, he's also going to touch on you know, next steps, and, and I think part of the panel discussion, we can maybe focus on this last mile issue. So our next presenter is uh, Jessica Fairbrother, and she comes to us from ETH Zurich, where she's completing her PhD in iodine and the thousand day window. And uh, she has a long career in both uh, human nutrition, uh, in academia, as well as in the pharmacy industry. So Jessica. Thank you very much, Greg. It's a nice introduction. Yeah, good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica. I work with uh, uh, Michael at the Human Nutrition Laboratory at the ETH Zurich. Um, I'm going to tell you, when my slides come up, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this evening about a few, well, one of the main uh, research efforts that, we have, that has come out of our lab recently on iodized salt, uh, ID nutrition, and the first thousand day window. So. I'm sure, I, I think uh, there are quite a few technical people in the room, but most of us, thank you very much, most of you will, uh, will I'm sure, know what exactly is the thousand days, but just to remind you, this starts from conception up until about age two. So we're talking about a window which is of prime importance where it comes to nutrition, and as we've just heard from, from Michael, actually prime importance for ID nutrition and for the development of these, uh, these infants and babies. So, we heard from Nicholas Christoph that actually, it's quite a bold claim saying that uh, a billion IQ points are lost due to iodine deficiency around the world. But I would like to actually also substantiate this claim now with the research that we know and actually state that we can make a difference of up to 12 IQ points if we correct severe iodine deficiency. Okay. The, the, the point difference is a little bit different if we correct a mild to moderate deficiency, but even a two-point difference, I think you will, you will probably all agree that actually that could make the difference between whether a child finishes school or, or not, which can then make a big difference long-term in that child and then that adult's life. So a little bit of... Uh, science for you. I promise not to bombard you with science, but I know that there are some technical people in the audience, so please do feel free to ask more technical questions later. Um, for those of you who uh, are familiar with reading this sort of chart, you will know it's a forest plot. For those of you who aren't, this type of plot basically puts together the results from different types of studies. So what we have here are two studies which have, um, two trials which have measured the impact of iodine supplementation against no iodine for cognition in school aged children. Now, without reading all of the complicated bits and pieces, if we, oh, sorry, if we look just in the part with the red square, we can actually see the results of both of these studies and the diamond which represents the pooled results from both of these studies. Now, we're comparing iodine supplements against, uh, uh, well, actually in this case, it was a placebo. It could also be uh, maybe no intervention or, you know, standard care, something like this. So what we actually see is a positive effect and we can clearly see that the pooled effect of all of the data from both of these studies falls well within the area that actually the positive area which means that iodine supplementation is actually favored for improvements in cognition for school-aged children. So when we look at the same sort of research which has been done for under fives we actually see a similar picture, which is very exciting. So all of these studies have actually looked at the effect of iodine versus no iodine in children under five years. And again, we can see in the red square at the bottom that the total effect actually falls well within the iodine, uh, the iodine part, meaning that iodine supplementation does actually improve the cognition in this group. But again, in our previous presentation, we also saw uh, things to do with dwarfism. So what happens with iodine supplementation in, with growth? Here we have, again, two trials which have compared iodine versus no iodine. 
on a biochemical marker of growth. And again, we can see that here, the pooled result and even the individual results of these studies are well in favor of iodine supplementation for promoting growth. So most of these are supplementation within school-aged children. We saw slightly uh, less than that under five years, but here we're really interested in the thousand-day window. So I mentioned that thousand days starts with conception. During this period, actually, it's very important that pregnant women start to have enough iodine because they have to not only provide iodine for themselves, but also their developing baby. And actually, the increase in iodine needs to provide for an increase of 50% more thyroid hormone production. After pregnancy, this still continues. The lactating mother must also uh, provide enough iodine within the breast milk to also support her baby. And indeed, infants in general have higher requirements for iodine than at any other time of life. So how do we make sure that all of this is actually going to get to this population group? Well, at the beginning, we saw that supplementation studies are very effective for cognition, for growth markers, but actually supplementation studies are maybe not the best way to reach the thousand day population. But what about salt? We know that salt is uh, an effective way of reaching the whole population. It's cheap, it's cost effective, and it works. We've seen that. But does it work for meeting the needs of the thousand days? the pregnant women, the lactating women, and the infants. Well, we designed this study in collaboration with GAIN and with UNICEF. It's an international collaborative study known quite, quite nicely as Simplify, salt iodization meeting the needs of pregnancy, lactation, and infancy. So what was the objective of this study? Well, we wanted simply to find out if salt iodization is actually going to cover effectively the first thousand day window. So this would include the pregnant women, lactating women and their breastfeeding infants, and then also weaning infants, making that really important transition from breast to table. But we wanted to make sure that actually, whilst the salt, iodized salt is actually going to cover this group, as long as it's not going to put any other population group at risk from having too high intakes of iodine. So what did we do? We took uh, six population groups, so the six, the four from the thousand days, plus uh, women of reproductive age, childbearing age, and also school children. And we measured their iodine intake across three countries with well-functioning salt iodization programs. So these were Croatia, China, and the Philippines. And we actually measured iodine intake in over 6,000 samples from women, children, and infants. We also took household salt samples, and we measured those to uh, see whether the salt was correctly iodized or not, which gives us an indication of whether the salt iodization policy is really functioning very well in these countries. It was. The salt is iodized to around about 25 milligrams per kilogram. And this is nicely reflected in the results of the study. So here we have the graph representing the iodine intake across all groups. We have the children and the women of reproductive age, which show nicely that actually these groups are well covered uh, in terms of um, their intake, but there is no risk of excessive intakes in these population groups. And we can also see that across each of the other groups, the thousand day window, that everyone is covered. Now you may be thinking that actually the lactating women might be uh, a little bit on the lagging behind side, but actually, the way we measure iodine intake is actually through iodine excretion, and it's normally in the urine. But as we know, the lactating woman has also got to provide iodine for her baby within the breast milk. So when we measure urinary iodine concentration and breast milk iodine concentration together, we realize that actually the lactating woman is iodine sufficient. And this is also reflected in the uh, iodine intake that we measured in the infant group and also later on in the toddler group to age two. So we can clearly see that here iodized salt is really working very well across all population groups. So the Simplify study was an important study. It has nicely concluded that when salt iodization policies are implemented effectively, that actually they really cover 
everyone, right through from conception through to old age. And uh, the most important thousand day vulnerable window is adequately covered as well. But secondly, the Simplify study also represents a really important success um, for academia and also uh, on an agency level. This is a fantastic collaboration that we've had um, between uh, ourselves at the ETH Zurich and also GAIN, UNICEF and uh, lately the IDEAN Global Network. And we hope that with their support that we can manage to quickly get this message out to the uh, policy policymakers who actually need to hear it. So once again, I would welcome your questions, technical questions a bit later on, but I'd like to leave you now with some conclusions. Iodized salt, iodized salt programs when they are correctly implemented and well monitored will reach everyone through pregnancy to old age, including the vulnerable thousand day window. Iodine deficiency can impair growth and development including a loss of potential IQ, but if this deficiency is corrected, IQ can be raised for up to 12 points, which could make the difference in re these children realizing their potential. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jessica. I think there's a lot of excellent information there, which we should talk about in detail during the question and answer session, unless there's burning questions now. The, um, but the takeaway is very clear and very exciting, I think, again, when we commission this with ETH, you know, is saltization a thousand day window intervention? Can we reaffirm it as the way forward to ensure optimal iodine nutrition for all target groups? And I think this study has shown that it can be when it's done well. Thank you. So our <coughs> Well, versus uh, growth, and you said on a, the effect on a biochemical marker of growth. Which one? Um, the, so actually, the results on uh, on the slide actually are um, insulin-like growth factor. Yes. More question, but uh, there is like a growing trend of uh, trying, like of public health measures trying to reduce salt consumption of population in general. So how we can align these two kind of contrary tendencies together? If you know, if we need to iodinize salt, but at the same time we have to reduce its consumption. It might be a good segue to our next presentation. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I think it will be answered and then we can have more question and answers on that. So. Yeah, our, so our, our next speaker, thank you, Jessica, is Dr. Francesco Branca. He's the head of the Department for Nutrition and Development at WHO. And I know you had a, a, a distinguished career before that. One thing I picked up only today is that you were president of the Federation of European Nutrition Societies, I believe. So. I come from research, actually. Okay. Great. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come and, and talk to you. So, yeah. Uh, what I would like to, to tell you is that uh, we need to walk this last mile together. It can be as all the last miles difficult, but uh, I think there are, we have opportunities to do that. And so first of all, I'd like to say, I think this was already shown by Michael, that we wanted to um, consolidate the success and just put down all the success stories in a systematic review. And that's what uh, WHO's task is, I mean, to, to, to make sure that public health intervention have the uh, necessary solid uh, scientific background. So this systematic review was, was really important. Um, it was um, also looking at a lot of what's been done in China. So it took some time to translate all the papers say, from Chinese into, into English. But you, you heard it already, I mean, the, the reduced risk of goiter, the cretinism, uh, the cognitive functions improvement and intake, uh, increased intake of iodine. So, so this systematic reviews allow WHO to um, formulate a guideline which is done according to a process which is a very solid process that WHO ha has with a, with a guideline review committee that reviews and uh, 
checks on the quality of the work uh, that is done by, by our department. And uh, the uh, recommendation is now that all food grade salt uh, used in household and food processing uh, should be fortified with iron as a safe and effective strategy for the prevention and control of iron deficiency disorders in population living in stable and emergency settings. So um, the universal uh, salt iodization is an important element, I mean all salt, um, used uh, for when you add uh, at home but also in the processing of food. And at the same time, and it is in the, uh, response to the question before, WHO was also developing some guidance about uh, the appropriate intake of sodium, because as you know, uh, uh, excess sodium is actually associated with uh, higher blood pressure and increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke. So the recommendation of uh, um, sodium um, that WHO was developing was to keep it um, to below two grams uh, per day. This is sodium, which translates into five grams of uh, sodium chloride, so salt, in adults. And in children, you know, the similar but simply adjusted amount based on the uh, difference in energy intake, so basically adjusting for the dimensions of the children and the amount of, of, of food that children eat. And WHO has actually started to develop programs for that. I mean, this is uh, um, the advocacy work that we're doing called SHAKE strategy, and this is about uh, measuring the uh, intake in population, uh, reformulating uh, um, the food, and uh, having good labeling standards, communicating, and making sure that uh, public institutions buy the food which doesn't have too much salt in it. Uh, so, yes, we can make compatible the two, the two recommendations and the two policies. We can uh, uh, make sure that we reduce the salt to less than five grams per day and at the same time um, reach uh, everybody with uh, iodized salt. And actually, we learned from Switzerland and we learned from Finland, because they also have been you know, looking at uh, the way to make the strategies compatible. And this is the table that uh, we have developed. Uh, so uh, as you heard, the, 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 um, somehow the uh, addition of iodine is in the order of uh, 20 to 25 uh, milligram per kilogram, which is corresponding to an intake of eight to 10 grams of salt. So basically, we're calculating the iodization level based on a consumption of 10 grams, which is what you see in most populations. It's a lot. We're eating too much salt in, in Europe. But you know, if you um, keep it to below five grams, then we need to increase the uh, uh, iodization. And, and so that, that's actually possible. So the important thing is to make sure that we, we measure both the uh, salt and the iron to make sure that the ionization is adequate and we do need to cover the whole population. So World Health Assembly is, is basically recognizing this. So we have both a resolution saying we need to do universal salt ionization and a resolution saying that uh, um, we need to reduce salt. And there's, a, there's actually a target to reduce salt by 30%. So message is clear. Um, we need to continue with salt iodization, so definitely the last mile uh, has to envision salt iodization. There are alternative measures, uh, you know, getting the iodine into the food chain. Um, in Finland, they use the salt mix, so they take care of these big blocks of salt for the cows, and then the cows lick it, and then it goes into the system, and then you drink iodized milk in that. But, well, that's that's uh, in still in many countries the iodization is an important way to look at it. So, so how, what can we do? And the banner there, there's a, a decade of action nutrition which has been declared by the General Assembly of the United Nations, meaning we need to, uh, we have little time, we want to address a lot of the nutrition challenges that we have in the world, um, um, undernutrition, overweight, we need to challenge, we need to give it a boost in the next 10 years. So, I think we should include iodine deficiency disorders in that package. So we need to address 
uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies and including uh, the iron deficiency so in this uh, next 10 years. Uh, the decade is uh, basically an opportunity for countries to make smart commitments, to be very specific about what they want to do. It's not sufficient to say we want to improve nutrition. We, want to, we have to say what exactly we want to improve and how. And the decade of action um, has areas of action in the food system, in health, uh, in social protection, in trade, uh, in the food environment, uh, breastfeeding, and in a good system of accountability. So we can ask governments to make commitments which are smart, and we can ask them to give us evidence that progress has been done, and so we can track their commitment. And I'm proud to say that uh, this assembly was starting to receive some smart commitment, Brazilians made uh, some um, on Monday, the Ecuadorians are going to make uh, some on Thursday, and uh, Burkina Faso. So, so countries are starting to realize uh, um, what they're up to. So um, really, I think that uh, uh, the opportunities would be to ask countries to make this smart movement. And I think as a, as a nutrition community, and particularly as you know, a group of advocates for the reduction of iron deficiency disorder, we have to be very specific. Um, I've seen the list of 19 countries which are still not done. And so we need to, you know, country by country to do an analysis of what is that uh, they need to do, why their um, uh, strategies are not sufficient. Uh, I think none of them really has uh, refused to do the, the validation. So it's probably more of an implementation challenge that we have. So, so this is uh, you know, what I would like to propose. We have a recommendation of the Second International Congress of Nutrition which is to improve the intake of micronutrients. So for example, we can ask, you know, by 2025, the Ministry of Health has adjusted the policies of salt realization based on the date on dietary salt intake and the median level of urinary iron of the population. So better strong system, strong monitoring system, better quality uh, of the iodization. I think this is something which, you know, with the modern technology, we are um, joint uh, uh, advocacy community is something that we can implement. So I'm inviting everybody to use this. And uh, uh, um, as uh, WHO, we are uh, fit for purpose. So we have uh, you know, some, there's a new strategy, our guidelines, uh, our relationship with countries, uh, our uh, monitoring and surveillance. So we're going to be certainly part of the community. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks so much, much Francisco. Francisco. A lot of excellent action points we can discuss in a moment. We have one more presentation. It's from Jonas Volmer, who comes to us from the Effective Altruism Foundation. And uh, he has a background in economics um, and also has served on the board of multiple charities. So I'll let him answer what is effective altruism. It's a very, I think, compelling that this movement on what is effective giving has picked up solidization. So. Jonas, thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to speak here about uh, the global movement. I'm glad to speak here about the global movement and philosophy of effective altruism and how it relates to iodine deficiency. Um, so first I want to give a brief overview of what effective altruism is, and um, afterwards I will I will explain um, why why this is relevant in the, in the context of iodine deficiency. So effective altruism is a, is a global movement that is best described by a question: How can we use our limited resources to help others the most? So um, this is the question that drives the people in this movement. Um, so we have two components: altruism, helping others for their own sake and effectiveness, helping them as much as possible. And I'm going to explain uh, both these principles with uh, two brief philosophical thought experiments. More formally, we could also say effective altruism is about maximizing output per input um, using evidence. This is another way of putting it. Um, so um, imagine that every day when you walk to work, you are confronted with a catastrophic situation, a uh, daily catastrophe maybe with people dying or uh, people suffering in some kind of way. And then the question is, if you, if you would be confronted with this, how would you react? Um, yeah, 
do you think um, there's something that should be done? Surely you would, be, you would get active in several ways. For example, you might consider donating money to organizations that help resolve this kind of catastrophic situation. Uh, maybe 10% of your income or even more. And you might also donate time. So you might um, try to, to help others with your career and uh, yeah, with, with what you with your, with your profession. Um, and now we can ask, is this spatial distance really relevant? So we, could, we, we can look at the global situation and we see that still um, 16,000 people, uh, children under five are, are dying every day from easily preventable diseases. And we have all kinds of other global challenges. And we could ask, is, is this spatial distance between, between the people we see here and the people in developing countries, is this really ethically relevant? How does this suffering, this, this catastrophe become less relevant when we move it uh, further away? And um, indeed, I would say on our planet, disaster strikes every day, and we can do something about it. And this is actually what effective, effective altruists do. So many actually decide to donate 10% um, of their income to effective charities. Um, globally, it's, uh, several thousand people have done this. And many have also um, tried to change their career um, in order to do more good. Now we come to the second part, the effectiveness part. And again, I want to um, uh, introduce this to you with a thought experiment. So imagine that you're a firefighter standing in front of two uh, burning buildings, a big one and a small one. And in the big one, you have 100 people who need to be saved. And in the small one, you have one person that needs to be saved. And now, um, you as a firefighter uh, can only go into one of these houses uh, to save the people in there that are trapped in there. Um, and you also get a third option. You can go to a bar and have a beer. Yeah, so who would, who would uh, go for option one? Yeah, I guess maybe, maybe the question is really obvious when I put it this way. But um, actually, I think this is really important. So um, in fact, the, the rationale for, for this focus on effectiveness um, is based on two main assumptions. First, all lives have equal value. And second, we should improve each life as much as possible. And if you decided to go for the first house in the example just before, you basically, um, I would assume that these uh, two reasons were, were the ones why you went for this. And this basically leads us to some form of triage, prioritization, quantification, because we need to find out how we can help the most. And um, more formally, we could also say, with our actions, we should try to maximize the cost of the output per input ratio. And um, there are several ways of um, justifying this. So we could, for one thing, just think of um, common sense examples. So at the emergency unit, if you have a, um, say, um, some kind of uh, say a stroke, um, you get treated immediately, but if you have something small, you have to wait for a longer time. Um, our health system is optimized for, for helping the largest amount of people with the limited resources that we have, and um, our traffic laws are similar. We can also uh, go to look into philosophy, and there we find um, many, many examples. So, for example, the golden rule or the veil of ignorance. So these are always uh, thought experiments where you imagine that you don't know which place you're uh, going to take in the world. And then the question is, which actions or which policies are more, most likely to, to help you? And because um, helping the most people always maximizes the probability that you personally will be helped, uh, this seems to be um, the best course of action. And we can also um, introspectively think about uh, why quantities matter. Um, so it seems that the duration or quantity of suffering that we endure is uh, relevant, and this is why we should we should um, yeah, maximize effectiveness. We could also call this a uh, more calculating approach. Now, um, in fact, altruism basically, um, so these principles aren't really new. They are standard um, health economics and uh, to some extent also development economics. Um, and have been so for a long time. Um, so what's new about effective altruism? Effective altruism is a global movement. 
So we have all around the globe, especially at the University of Oxford and in Silicon Valley, lots of people who use evidence and um, data-driven approaches towards uh, doing as much good as possible. And effective altruism is also bringing effective philanthropy uh, to <coughs> private donors. So, so far, um, uh, effective philanthropy was mostly, yeah, these kinds of ideas were mostly implemented by governments and big foundations. But now what we see is that actually private donors are, are um, starting to ask the same kinds of questions and are, are taking the same kinds of actions. Effective altruism also uh, is thinking a lot about cost prioritization. So how do I compare completely different problems? How do I compare climate change and international development? international development or animal welfare, all these kinds of um, different causes. And uh, in fact, Algen has developed some frameworks for, for comparing these uh, different um, issues. The topic of career choice is also really important. We spend 8,000 hours of our lives in uh, our careers. And there is an organization called 8,000 Hours that has advocated several ways of doing more good with one's career. So naturally this, um, for example, involves doing direct work for, for highly effective organizations. Um, but there, uh, the organization you work for is really important. Um, and uh, doing research uh, also seems really important, uh, going into policy and so on. So they have uh, written detailed career profiles on all these kinds of questions. And one idea that is especially um, novel and maybe provocative is the idea of earning to give. So this is the idea that um, people who are um, interested in having an impact with their career and have a background, for example, in a quantitative subject, go into um, some kind of career that is particularly well paid, such as quantitative trading, and just try to earn as much money as possible so they can donate as much money as possible. Works on our organization, the Effective Altruism Foundation. Um, we have two offices in Basel and Berlin. We were founded in 2013, have about 20 employees, and we're promoting these ideas in the German speaking um, area. We provide philanthropic advice and career advice. Uh, we raise uh, money for effective charities, and we also do research. And we have a ballot initiative in the city of Zurich that asks for 1% of the city's budget for um, against global poverty and uh, also asks for, these, for this uh, budget to be allocated to particularly effective charities. And um, we've also published, or we, we're going, going to publish this week, a, a policy paper on evidence-based foreign aid um, for Germany and Switzerland. Um, yeah, yeah, now I want to go back to charity evaluation. Um, so this is a topic I haven't really touched yet. Uh, so how do effective altruists find out which charities are most effective? Um, we have uh, four criteria that are really important here. Um, so first of all, effectiveness. Um, so I want to be sure that a charity actually has an impact. Cost effectiveness. I want to be sure that this impact is reduced at as little cost as possible. Um, or again, that this input output ratio um, is uh, phenomenal. I also want the organization to have a lot of room for more funding. So if an organization is getting funded anyway, if I give them additional resources, I might, might not be doing much good. For example, um, immunizations are a very effective intervention, but they're fully funded by several international donors. Um, and transparency, of course, and uh, when I say transparency, I really mean outstanding transparency, um, organizations that really publish a lot of the data just publicly on their website. Um, and these are the criteria that give well um, a U.S. charity evaluator uses to evaluate um, uh, different programs. And the reason why I think this kind of process or this kind of approach is really important is because there are vast differences in cost effectiveness between different charities. So what we see here is um, how many healthy years of life we get for a donation of $1,000. Um, and this is based, uh, these are different, um, all kinds of different health programs. Um, and so we see that a lot of charities, or a lot of programs actually, um, have 
relatively small impact, but with a few, um, like maybe one or two or a small number, we have a very large outsized impact. And so it's really important to um, find these kinds of opportunities if we want to have, yeah, make as much of a difference as possible. And so this is what, what uh, GiveWell does um, based on the criteria I just uh, mentioned. If you check out the website, maybe uh, uh, I would highly recommend to, to look at it. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and they, they also, also recommend salt iodization. And I want to explain briefly how uh, IGN and Spain um, fulfill these criteria. So, so first, again, again, you have effectiveness. I think we've seen this. Um, so so GiveWell mainly quotes the effects, effects on treating mild to moderate efficiency um, with a uh, gain of a um, small number of IQ points. And, and then the cost effectiveness, effectiveness um, how much does it cost to provide iodization? Uh, that's about 10 cents per person per year, so that's really cheap. And um, then GiveWell calculates the cost effectiveness. And they, um, because they have to compare totally different charities, they convert this into a single currency. And what it comes down to is that salt iodization programs probably have a cost effectiveness of about $7,000 per equivalent life saved. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about this later if people are interested. Um, but I won't go much further into this now. Um, and they conclude that this cost effectiveness is in the same range of cost effectiveness as other priority programs. And room for funding, uh, there's a lot of room for funding, and uh, GAIN and IGEN are both highly transparent, and uh, yeah, GiveWell has, um, has uh, um, commended them for, for sharing information very um, proactively and openly. And based on this, they've ranked them standard charities. Yeah, and um, I guess I, I hope I was able to explain why, why um, from an effective altruist perspective, salt iodization might be a top priority or a very high priority. And um, yeah, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jonas, very much. I think we have about 20 minutes for question and answers. Actually, if you wouldn't mind, we'll all take a seat up at the uh, and uh, it's really over to you to try to ask one, one question succinctly. If you sneak two in, we might take the mic from you. But um, no, please feel free to ask anything. We've, we've covered a lot of ground, I think, today on um, the history of iodization, iodine nutrition, um, thousand day window, next steps, and effective giving. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the speakers for presenting an important public health subject. And uh, my, my question is, can one of the speakers present the website where we can see the 99 countries that don't have an uh, effectively implemented salt utilization program? So that we can have an idea which countries in the world don't have an effective program. The World Health Organization uh, Micronutrients Group and um, the Iodine Global Network work together to um, keep track of global and national progress against iodine deficiency. In my final slide, I did have a uh, website, which is the Iodine Global Network website, which shows what is what we term the, the uh, global scorecard against iodine deficiency. And in that scorecard is listed each country and uh, current status in, pr in um, um, school children and in pregnant women. So based on those data in that scorecard, there's a list of the 19 countries which um, still remain iodine deficient at the, at the national level. So the Iodine Global Network website, Global Scorecard, would be the place to go. question for Jonas to begin with, but I think others on the panel might uh, want to address as well. Um, what you talked about in looking at cost effectiveness is kind of at the level of doing the intervention. So we can compare giving a child an immunization or iodizing salt or providing health care. Those are fairly easy to do. Economists have been working on those kinds of things for 
you know, decades. decades. But what we heard tonight was um, activities at a very different level. You know, the World Health Organization tries to set up a decade of action to activate people to, to take more action on nutrition more generally. You have research efforts. You have the iodine global nutrition um, that tries to bring together multiple organizations. And so it's investing in collaboration to move agendas forward. How do you evaluate that as an investment? How do we know that investing in partnerships and research and activation and advocacy, what, how do you value that against spending money on immunizing a child? Yeah, so I, I would say that these questions are um, really difficult to evaluate and quantify, but I don't think it's impossible. So I would say that there are um, some useful frameworks that can be used for, for, um, for trying to quantify even, the, even these more, more difficult interventions or yeah, projects. Um, but uh, yeah, and there's, so for, for example, for research, um, there are actual, actually ways of, of trying to come up with like how, mu how, how much earlier um, is a particular program to going to develop a certain intervention or how much better is that um, how, how, how big is the most likely improvement going to be um, compared to the current best options available and then you can um, based on the data you already have on the effectiveness of the intervention can try to calculate what the what kind of value the the research adds um, yeah but um, I, yeah and there, so, for example, the Effective Altruism community has developed some of those frameworks or adopted other ones that exist already. And um, so, yeah, I would say it's not impossible to quantify, but it's difficult and everything needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Jonas, can I add on to that? Is it safe to say that GiveWell, because our interactions with them, they haven't really looked at issues that are less attributable to every dollar spent. So advocacy, it's hard to attribute activity to that and so therefore there doesn't seem to be anybody out there give well included rating those kind of communications advocacy uh, charitable actions is that safe there actually is um, there so is. there is a spin-off uh, from give well called the open philanthropy project which um, does this to some extent but um, yeah so one one framework that is commonly used is also the scope neglectedness tractability framework um, so um, yeah, maybe I could explain that briefly. Um, so, scope uh, of a problem means um, how big is it, how many people are are at stake, how, how many people are suffering, um, something like this. Um, neglectedness uh, stands for how many other players are working in the field and um, how, how big is my additional contribution, how high is the marginal value that I can add. And tractability um, refers to yeah, just uh, um, how, yeah, how much, uh, how, how tractable is the problem? And um, yeah, there are more formal ways of putting numbers on, on, these, uh, on each of these factors. Um. Add a couple of points to the discussion on cost effectiveness. I mean, uh, one important element is also to calculate the actual um, cost of the intervention compared to the um, income of countries that should implement it. So, in, a, in other words, is that intervention affordable? And actually, salt iodization is extremely affordable because it's a very cheap intervention. Um, we have, uh, um, I think, the, the overall uh, set of uh, nutrition or diet-related uh, diseases which are the t on the top of the scale of the global burden of disease. Unhealthy diet is number one, uh, child and maternal malnutrition is number three, obesity is number six. So we're talking about something which is extremely relevant for, for the health and, uh, and, uh, of, of the people of the world, for the survival and for the prevention of disability. And then we have a you know, cost of uh, an envelope, which, uh, for example, for the, um, what we call the, the, the global nutrition targets, has been calculated in seven billion um, dollars for the next 10 years. In order, so in order to fix the nutrition problem, you need that kind of money. 
And there's also another way to quantify this. It's actually, I would say, you know, looking at, uh, for example, how much it's spent on agricultural subsidies, totally affordable amount. And I think that's also an, another important message to give. So we're not talking about something which is out of reach. It's actually, you know, very possible. It's within our capacity. Maybe I can add something briefly. So um, I was also. So there are different um, oper oper operationalizations of cost effectiveness, and um, so the one that I was using is simply. Um, that we try to find the most cost-effective interventions and then um, just use the resources uh, for those uh, until we run out of resources. And there are different um, ways. And so I agree that affordability, de depending on the definition, affordability is, uh, is a really important aspect of this. Yeah. Iodine comes from a multitude of sources. How significant is the risk of overdose and what can be consequences? Let's look on the other side of this question as well, can we? Very good question. I mean, um, more iodine is not necessarily better. Um, too much, uh, you know, it's, it's been shown repeatedly that if you introduce over iodized salt, for example, to populations, or you suddenly increase iodine intakes in populations, it does have adverse effects. I mean, the main adverse effects are on the thyroid gland, and there's a small increase in both hyper and hypothyroidism, and autoimmunity when iodine is introduced into populations, especially when it's introduced in large amounts very rapidly. Um, so there, is, there are side effects. One of the key the concepts behind iodine programs is they have to very careful, carefully and systematically monitor for both, both iodine, iodine deficiency and excess. Um, it's, it's just as important to avoid excess as deficiency. So it's a very, very good point, and it's something that we always are um, emphasizing when it comes to programs. Uh, Michael, if I may. So you showed a map at one point Brazil was excess. I think it's not anymore. And then another point, but on the deficiency side, can you say something about the fact that even though a country at a national level might be sufficient, there might be some subnational, even large subnational populations, like in India, I can think of a couple of regions that represent a huge amount of people. So I don't know if you have any figures on how many of the so-called national sufficient countries are actually iodine deficient in subnational regions. So. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, the, the maps that I've shown and the global scorecard to a certain extent simplify things. They, show, they so show national estimates of iodine status. And certainly in big countries like India um, and countries like Indonesia, even the Philippines, there's probably substantial segments of the population that remain deficient if they're not reached by iodized salt. I mean, iodized salt is a, is, a is a very equitable intervention because it does tend to be, to reach high coverage rates, but it's not perfect and it, it I mean, UNICEF has um, demonstrated repeatedly that in many countries, lower socioeconomic status populations are not reached as effectively by IDSL programs. So it's, it's also um, you know, a very important point when it comes to um, program maturity and that we need to start looking carefully if we're missing certain vulnerable segments that aren't reached by IDSL. Case of Brazil, um, switching, because it looks like it went from excess to Normal now? Yeah. Is that, is yeah, that Brazil, also? Yeah. Bra Brazil was a, an example of a country that does do very, very um, effective uh, systematic monitoring of iodine intakes with surveys, national surveys, large ones every five years on the recommendation from WHO. And they showed in two surveys um, that their median iodine intakes were in school children were too high. So they um, discussed among all stakeholders and decided to lower the iodine concentration in the salt. I think they had it as high as 60 um, ppm at one point. So now it's down around 40 ppm, and that has led to a decrease in iodine intakes throughout the population and brought in iodine intakes into the normal range in Brazil. So it's a real important um, uh, and good large example of how careful monitoring can optimize iodine intakes.
I have one more for uh, the evaluation part, basically, but I think it's something that the people who work on it can answer better. How soon do you think will we actually hit diminishing marginal returns? If we talk about $7,000 per life saved equivalent, yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> but um, how soon do you think this number will hike up because there's very um, rural areas that are hard to get to somehow because they don't just use the soil that they were offered? And so how soon do you think this intervention will become a lot more expensive? Okay, I could, <laughs> I could take a stab at it. Try to extrapolate yeah. from past well, historical data. I'll start and then maybe others can, because um, again, what we've noticed with our programs is that in fact it's that last mile that's the most expensive, right? So. When the World Bank costed saltitization at five cents per child per year in, I think it was 2002 was the last study, some, somewhere around there, that was looking at sustained efforts that had been ongoing for a decade. When you go to a new country, and especially in a rural area where you're trying to work with small scale salt producers, our findings are it's 20 cents per person per year. Then it goes down to 10 cents once you're in that kind of improved stage, you've already built the program, and then it goes down to maybe, maybe lower that once you're sustaining. So you're quite right. I think that last mile in these last 19 countries are going to be a little bit more expensive to begin with, but it's not 20 cents per person per year, even if it is that high, it's still a drop in the bucket considering that we're going to, so that, that, that's an initial response. Um, anybody? No. I wanted to say that uh, in reality, uh, what we're looking at is not just uh, the covering, the, you know, who is not yet covered, but also fine-tuning these programs and making them an integral part of the food system. And you heard universal um, uh, salt iodization means that all the salt that is used in processing should be iodized. That's not the case. Also because there's some legislative problem in some of, some of the countries. I mean, the French, for example, don't want to use the iodized salt in their cheese. And uh, so I think we need to also work on, on that side of the story so that it doesn't become, uh, you know, in the, this, I think in these last years, uh, it, the, the approach we've used has been uh, almost like, you know, uh, you know a vertical program emergency type of approach because we had a big issue, big problem, you, you, you saw that. Now, probably we're sort of thinking of integrating this more into the routine of food system, and I think then even the, 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 the thinking about the cost changes because it becomes a component of, of, of sort of a standard routine cost. That's what I'm really saying. So something that uh, one could maybe add is also the question of room for more funding. So this is kind of related. So when, um, when does GiveWell think uh, these organizations um, will stop to have room for more funding. And I think, uh, I'm not sure if I rem remember correctly, but I think the answer is in the tens of millions um, or maybe like maybe up to a hundred million or something like that of additional funding. And then um, there will be diminishing returns according to GiveWell's understanding. But this is just, um, yeah, the judgment of one organization that has uh, looked into, into the situation for these uh, two organizations. Yeah. We've heard about the, the health benefits of salt iodization um, and we've heard about the cost effectiveness, effectiveness of it, the $7,000. Is the IQ of potentially millions of people, even by a single point that has potential uh, potentially large um, knock-on economic benefits. I'm wondering, firstly, if... Could potentially even have a cost of cost saving effect um, if, if done that.
I realize my presentation had, may have been a bit confusing. So this um, the seven thousand uh, dollars per equivalent life saved is actually just a guess of of the economic of the like economic benefits translated into how much life saved that's worth, basically. So um, yeah, actually. The thing that you mentioned, so um, IQ gains leading to additional um, economic development is the only factor that's incorporated uh, into this estimate, or um, I think the main one at least. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm not aware of any studies linking IQ gains to increased growth, um, and GiveWell deal with this by coming up with a range of estimates and yeah, trying to make this more robust but it's it's very uh, sketchy so this is so i also wouldn't put much weight on this on this figure of seven thousand dollars it could be just um as easily three thousand or maybe twenty thousand or or something like that yeah yeah one cost benefit figure that um we often use in the sector sorry Sophie, um is uh for every dollar spent on saltitization you usually will see returns in the range of about 27. That's one figure that economists have looked at, and it, it refers back to this socioeconomic development that you get in, in due course because of the iodine. So. Right, the Copenhagen consensus, yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One is about why, I mean, to these experts in iodine and salt, why did they decide it at the beginning here in Switzerland that the salt has to be the one that has to be fortified? That's one question. And my second question is, I don't know if there is any research apart from salt that uh, is being fortified and other foods with iodine. So, I mean, I know salt iodization is like the obvious thing, but right now is there any other research about other staple foods in other regions that uh, is also a important, I mean, that can have an impact in public health? Well, I think, um, you know, salt was identified by the Swiss authorities at the time because they looked around the country and they said, what, what um, food or what condiment is consumed in all cantons, um, consumed at fairly constant levels throughout the population, is consumed by all age groups, and decided salt would be the right vehicle. So um, that's the reason I think Switzerland originally turned towards salt as a vehicle, and that's why it's been such a successful vehicle. Is that most countries recognize that um, it's just the it's just the vehicle to use. It's it's inexpensive. It's consumed by all levels of uh, society, from poor to rich. It's consumed at fairly narrow intake ranges throughout the year. There's not big differences in seasonal intakes. Salt can't be overconsumed. So for all these reasons, for most countries, it's the idea vehicle. Uh, there has been some um, discussion about alternative vehicles. One example is in Southeast Asia, where table salt is not the main condiment used to season food, where maybe fish sauce or soy sauce is used. And for example, in Cambodia and in Laos and in Thailand, fish sauce is also being fortified with iodine. To, uh, table salt is as well, but in addition, fish salt is. Also, um, several countries, uh, Australia being one of them, have decided that instead of uh, fortifying all table salt, they'll fortify just baker's salt so that um, bread and baked goods become the primary vehicle for iodine through their addition of iodized baker's salt. That's also been effective in Denmark. Up on that point, um, salt iodization has been a great strategy for a long time because of its ubiquity in, in use of table salt. We haven't really made that crossover in very many countries into processed foods. Um, and as the diet is shifting in many countries, we have a real danger that the, the sole focus on table salt um, could become a problem for, for iodine nutrition. So we have to think about how this is going to transition as the diet transitions. But I think it's an important transition into some of the things that Francesco was talking about of the salt intake in the population. And the main strategy that is being focused on to control salt intake is 
re, um, reformulation of foods to, to take down the salt intake. And I think this is an important place where we can not only see that these are compatible interventions, but in fact they're synergistic. We can learn from one another and work together with the salt reduction because of reformulation. They're going to have to be testing their foods. Are they still um, maintaining their taste properties? Do people still want them? Um, do they still have their organoleptic properties? As they bring down salt, but that's also an opportunity to say, but you can be adding iodine into those foods. Oftentimes that's the barrier is they don't want to use iodized salt because, well, it hasn't been tested. We don't know how that might affect the, the, the food. And so there's a perfect opportunity to work with them at that level. Also in monitoring, it's a perfect opportunity that they're now looking at what is the salt levels in urine. At the same time, we need to be doing more urine testing for iodine levels. So rather than this kind of perceived barrier of, oh, they're on one, one agenda, we're on a competing agenda, and can we put these together, I think there's actually great opportunities for us to work together and have stronger interventions both ways. Really good point. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that, but I think um, salt reduction and processed foods uh, both offer opportunities to strengthen salt hydration if, if we do it appropriately. Well, my question is about sustainability. Like, uh, you have many projects where investors come and they uh, carry out the, the, the program, they, they give money. But then when, even when WHO goes and assesses for one program, then when they leave, the capacity building wasn't done. So how, uh, how to, to also see the sustainability in these projects that uh, uh, you try to fund with uh, altruism? So um, it depends a bit on the program. Um, I would say that, um, so in terms of sustainability, also uh, one thing that we, we can just say for many of those programs is that they, just by, by this, uh, by, by, for example, um, getting uh, 40 iodized salt um, into this 1,000 days window, we can kind of achieve a, a long-term sustainable impact on those children. Um, so I think um, in terms of, Sustainability always de also depends on 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 like the exact um, definition, but um, I think uh, also in the case of IGN and GAIN, I think um, gov programs are also uh, coordinated with governments uh, who continue to. Maybe you can elaborate more on this. Um, and then for many other organizations, so for example, uh, dewarming programs, uh, these um, recommended charities also work with governments and try to hand over these programs to the governments in the long term. Um, and so depending on the program, you, you can see this kind of long-term sustainable um, yeah, program. Yeah. Let's go ahead and comment. Yeah, I, think, I think this is a very important point, the sustainability. So because we, we've been speaking about the 19 countries we have to deal with, but actually the, the, the system is changing in the other countries. And so just following up to what also Larry was saying, you know, we're transitioning in, in many countries to a situation where the food is not prepared at home. So what we used to add to the to the food is actually now present in the manufactured food. Change Change the food, food we eat. So, so if the f if the salt that iodizes the one that we add to the to the to the f food, uh, then you know the the whole calculation of intake is to be revised. And if we don't ensure that the manufactured food has that iodized salt, then, then we have a problem. So I think that that's a type of uh, you know reanalysis perhaps we need to to do. And uh, just to give you a figure, I mean we if we eat uh, 10 to 12 grams, uh, the manufactured part is the majority is is nine ten. So so and, and this is you know countries where the you know, most of our food. Uh, we're talking about 60, 70 percent comes from manufactured food. So, so it's changing. So, in Brazil, we still have a majority, majority of food coming from what we prepare at home, but it's changing all over the world. I read a statistic 70 percent of sodium intake in the US and UK can now comes from processed foods. So, you have to close the loophole and make sure those, that salt is iodized. Sorry, Michael. No, I, I think the question of sustainability is really an important one, and I think that. Um, 
we, um, we are successful in saltitization in achieving sustainability in terms of long term programs. A key is, just as was brought up by the question, is national ownership. So one of the key um, things that we emphasize in the iodine field is that although countries may get assistance at the beginning to get their programs underway, the key is to transfer expertise and a feeling of ownership to the countries. The iodine global network, for example, tries to establish a national representative who is a uh, a local, local person. person, either in the Ministry of Health or maybe in academics, who is going to be the person who is going to bring the stakeholders together over long the long term and maintain the national program. In, what's uh, uh, a good example of sustainability in iodine is the last year we celebrated the what we call the sustained elimination of iodine deficiency disorders from Latin America. And some programs in Latin America have been um, supplying iodized salt and have eliminated IDD from an area that was formerly had was one of the epicenters of iodine deficiency and cretinism for over two decades now. It becomes business as usual to, to a certain extent in the salt industry to iodize salt. Um, countries take possession of programs and are proud of them and want to maintain them at high quality. So. Um, but it is, as, as Francesco says, we have, we have a, a handful of countries remaining that we need to achieve breakthroughs in, but we also at the same time have to be very careful that we maintain, you know, the programs uh, and sustain them in the countries where we've been effective. So we are at the hour. Thank you, Michael. Maybe one last comment or question and then we'll close off. Any, any, um, yes, the final, you get the final question or, yep. Privileged to get the last question, but uh, many thanks for the excellent presentations from all four. Um, I was wondering, I wanted to know a little bit more about the Effective Altruism Network. How many charities are there? Where do you work? What was the uh, capital that you were able to mobilize? Um, and the other question was globally. Um, has one estimated? the financing gap for the decade and how much funding would you need to be able to move those 19 countries out of their deficiencies? In terms of um, numbers, n number of people who are in involved in the movement, um, that's maybe 10,000 globally. Um, so yeah, uh, mostly um, in Europe and and uh, North America and Australia, there are lots of people who are, are involved with this and um, the amount of funding that goes towards effective charities um, is uh, growing very rapidly. So I actually don't know the most recent figures, but I think it's on the order of 100 million per year or maybe 150, something like this. Um, but this is just uh, the volume of donations influenced uh, by GiveWell and uh, the whole movement and community is bigger and there are other uh, big donations that have been made uh, towards um, yeah, um, programs outside uh, global health and, and nutrition. Um, and uh, there was something I wanted to add. So the number of charities um, that are being recommended by GiveWell is still relatively small, I think at about um, 15 to 20 charities, something like that. And their reasoning is that basically they don't need to um, evaluate every charity and instead they should focus on finding the best ones um, because of the, the large differences in cost effectiveness that I showed in the chart beforehand. Um, and so they, they try, th th their focus is really um, on finding the best uh, charities instead of trying to, to rate everyone, yeah. Second part of your question, just on the unfinished agenda and financing it. I mean, I, I think it would need a proper bottom-up costing for each of those 19 countries. But to give an indication, uh, we had a $20 million grant at GAIN, which reached $500 million, approximately. Individuals that didn't have access to iodized salt, today they do in a sustainable way, and we're not involved anymore. So I think, I don't know how many millions are represented in those 19, but I would say it's probably going to take another 30 million or so dollar investment, which is small considering it's 19 countries, to, to get this job done. And that's something that we're all, you know, the Iodine Global Network, GAIN, WHO, UNICEF, and all the partners, we, we want to mobilize so we can work with governments and industry to, make, to, to get the job done. So. 
Maybe with that, did, any final words? Okay, so we do have some refreshments. Thank you all for coming. Um, all presentations, I think, can be made available, at a PDF, um, I believe, yes. And if, so just come up and talk to us afterwards, and we'd love to continue the dialogue on this important topic. So thank you.